Hello. <laughs> Actually, no, I think it's the people in the audience who are really interesting because I reckon that there are people from other awarding organisations here because I reckon they're all going round to each other's sessions trying to think, what are they doing? How are they going to assess fieldwork and so on? So, um, yeah, um, welcome. My name is Bob Digby. I'm a former uh, GA president two years ago. It was a far, far more unnerving experience uh, being in front of a, a large audience like Mark. I really felt for Mark this morning. But today I can kind of really indulge my passion, if you like, which is talking about inquiry in, in geography. And I, I'm going to try and start with, I suppose, a kind of a sort of scene setting of where we are now, and where we've been for the last, what, six years since 2009 and when the, new, the current GCSEs that people are teaching in schools uh, were, were introduced. And I want to try and think, if you like... A paint a sort of picture of where we are, because although Andy has stated that, you know, it's, it's sad in many ways that um, fieldwork is now going to be assessed by linear examination rather than by controlled assessment, I have to say I do know teachers who will be mopping their brows and saying, thank goodness, no more controlled assessment. And the trouble is, if you say to them then, does that mean you're happy about losing fieldwork? They go, no, 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 it's actually just a process of controlled assessment. So I want to try and unpick some of those things about what it is, if you like, we want to keep uh, from where we are at the moment and, and where we might be moving to. Because no doubt that if, if we're going to assess fieldwork, I think we have to th give some careful thought to what the principles are by which we live as geographers and why we do field work in the first place and why, why we hold on to it with a, with a kind of passion. And, and so I want to try and un unpick those things, controlled assessment, field work, and what is it we hope to get from those. Particularly then, you see, I think if we understand our principles and what it is we want from field work, it helps us to get to a point of when, we, when we say, well, if we can only assess this by examination, then we better do it well and in a way that we want to. Um, not just because that, I think, is a principal thing to do, but whatever we do and whatever starts in 2016, unless there's a sudden major bolt of lightning over, over the Department for Education in London that sort of changes people's brains, brain waves considerably, we'll be living with this probably till, what, 2022, 23, something like that. And, you know, I started drawing my state age pension last September and, I, you know, I ain't going to be doing the next lot, I don't think. That might be time for me to sort of hang up my, hang up my sort of rather, you know, sweaty gardeners, trainers and just sort of, you know, go to, a, go to a more retiring lifestyle. I don't know. It kind of feels as though we're at a landmark now and there are implications for whatever we do now for teachers and how we go about teaching and how we teach field work. So... Now, before we get to the last bit, which is kind of, you know, as a teacher, what do I do now? That's really that's just one slide at the end. I want to try and unpick those principles first. And, and I think if you want to sort of show where we are at the moment, I think the, one of the things I'm really glad about, since Michael Gove stood up and announced an end to coursework in Parliament in, early in 2011, my immediate sort of thought was, oh God, you know, fieldwork is going to go. And if fieldwork goes, then, then what happens to geography GCSE? Um, and, and I'm glad that actually in the last four years, all the awarding organisations, every single person, together with the GA, together with the RGS, together with the individuals, I could mention Eleanor Rawling, for instance, who represents both the RGS and the GA in, in kind of, if you like, trying to get through, through to Ofqual a sense <coughs> of what it is that we believe as geographers. So a whole range of people have really declared, if you like, their, their love of, their belief in, in field work. So I think from that position, we're, we're starting from a solid position. That we, I think we recognise as geographers the values of, of, of field work. But at the same time, many of us as day-to-day -day teachers know that as soon as curriculum change comes in, unless we've actually got a document that says field work will be assessed... We may have head teachers or SLT in schools who may say, well, look, you know, you just simply can't get, get time out of, out of school to do that. If you want to do field work, do it at half term or do it at weekends, do it during the holidays and so on. And although there will be teachers, you know, who always, I've seen, I'm, I'm, I'm really big into, you know, I love Twitter. And it's great to see teachers who've taken school trips to Iceland and so on. They've been doing things with students there during holiday time. That's not a recipe for safety. That's not a recipe for equality of opportunity because not everybody has a geography teacher who's willing to do that. Not everybody lives in an area where that, that's a financial possibility as well. And so you know, we need something more solid from, from, from which to start. And 
There are problems, undoubtedly, with controlled assessment, and, and I don't think it's the problem with field work. I haven't encountered any teachers who say, well, you know, we've got a problem in getting to the coast or to a river or to an urban area. Ge geographers do that quite happily. What they curse about is the problem with that high level of control of getting hold of the blooming IT resources in school, especially if you're in a geography year 10 or year 11 option group that's blocked against the IT GCSE group, and you don't stand a chance of getting you know, the single ICT room in school. Um, so, so that's become really difficult, and, and I think that people have rolled up their feelings about fieldwork and about coursework in with the administrative difficulties that, that are presented by that. But if we go back to fieldwork, I mean, Mark mentioned it this morning, Nick Lapthorne, who's, who's about to become the new uh, junior vice president for the GA in, in September. He works for the Field Studies Council. He set up the year of field work as being 2015. Starting in 2015 through to August 2016, geographers will be focusing on a year of field work. Now, I don't think we'd be doing that if we didn't have a pretty secure place from which to, from which to start. So the idea of 2015 being the start of a year of field work is good. Um, and there might be difficulties if I say now that all the awarding organisations are going to be requiring two days worth of field work for post-14, for GCSE. I mean, actually, we ought to be, be cheering that one, really celebrating that one, because that is a move forward. And it will be in pretty well every awarding organisation specification, I'm sure, as long as Ofqual approve all of those uh, by late May, early, early June. But two days of fieldwork means that we, we have a chance to do different fieldwork with students in what is simply saying at the moment, and I'll spell it out a little bit more in a minute, contrasting environments. And as if that wasn't enough, it does seem rather forgive me for saying a bit, it seems slightly schizophrenic to say, well, you know, you scrap uh, controlled assessment at GCSE only to bring in field work post-16. But I think the universities, and as uh, Alistair, who's here at the moment from QMUL, Alistair was part of uh, the university's advisory group who presented the post-16 subject content. And part of that was a strong belief from the universities. Was it unanimous, Alistair, that field work should be there? Post-16 field work should be there. And it seems to me... Something of an anachronism, if you, don't, if you scrap field work at GCSE but bring it in at 16, well, what are you going to be starting with at 16 if, if that's not the case? So I'm glad to see uh, two days of field work at GCSE. And February last year, I think there was a kind of peak, if you like, in political pressurising activity about trying to make a what people at the Institute for Education in the Field Studies Council who set up a seminar for a day, bringing together people from different organisations to talk about field work, to make a compelling case for fieldwork. Thinking, yes, we believe in it, but what's the case for it? And they came up with, I suppose, those four points on, on, on the board, on the screen there, which is geographers love to use real world settings. Um, I was dismayed when I went into a school a couple of months ago where I live in Cornwall. And actually, the, the teacher there had actually set up, I thought, was a, was a really good lesson. But it was about an imaginary country. And I can't imagine why, with 226, I think it is at the moment, countries in the world, why would you set up an imaginary country? You know, there's 226 to choose from, but you know, there are kind of real world cases out there that I think we need to make a, a, a case for using. In the same way, um, I'll use a case now which, which depressed me, actually, if I'm, I'm quite honest, when I looked at some controlled assessment last summer. Um, and it was a school that I actually, I knew the name, I knew where the school was, I'd heard of the head of geography and so on. But the controlled assessment was a piece of work on rivers. And very high achieving school. And when I, what I normally do is I look at the sort of the A border and I look at the C border just to see how the, I take a sort of sample from each kind of area of piece of work. So say something like 42 out of 50 and 32 out of 50, that sort of thing. And as I turned over the pages of two pieces of work, they looked the same. And what the teacher had done was taken the students to a river in southeast England, somewhere, and had chosen three points by which to measure river width, depth, velocity, you know, get the wellies on, all the traditional stuff that geographers do. And guess what? When he drew it on the graph, at point one, the river was quite narrow and it wasn't very deep and it didn't go very fast. And point two, it was a bit wider, a bit deeper and a bit faster. And point three, a bit wider, a bit deeper still and faster still. And all the graphs, as you're looking at them, went like that. And so, if that, in my experience, that's not how rivers are. The phrase that's more and more used, I, th I think I've heard it used by three of the four awarding organisations in describing fieldwork, is fieldwork ought to be a bit messy. 
There ought to be a few things there that we sometimes in geographers call statistical anomalies or things that don't quite conform or things that say that the real world is not quite like that single photograph that you might have of a stretch of river in the geography textbook that you use. You know, because publishers don't have many, many spaces to allow for photographs. You get these almost kind of stereotyped images that, that are passed around. And so if we can't broaden that on fieldwork, then, then what are we doing? So I think that application and evaluation of what we know to real-world situations seems to me to be fundamental to the value of fieldwork. And it ought to be a bit messy out there. You know, where, what is a CBD like? Or is there such a thing as a clone town? We take ideas sometimes and we say, well, actually, yes, this town is a bit clonish because it's like this. And actually, there are many ways in which it's not. It's different because it's like this. And it, it gives our more able students certainly something to, to grow grab hold of. So that real world learning, I think, is, is, is a powerful case. And actually, I've put at the, at, at the bottom there social dimensions. And if you're a purist, you might be looking at that and thinking, social dimensions, that's not what we're in geography for. You know, if we're field work, we're purists. Actually, my, some of my fondest memories in teaching are bringing six formers back from a short residential field trip and then to see them in the six form centre on the Monday morning when they've got back and they're huddled together. It's almost as though that experience of the field trip, they don't want it quite to end, or as though they've learnt something about each other. Um, you know, geographers are a pretty sociable lot generally, I think, and when you put geographers together, you get quite a good sort of, if you like, feeling. Now, that's a nice thing to have, but actually, my experience in teaching says when you've generated that feeling, my goodness, the group works better together. It's, it's a motivator, it, it, it raises achievement levels, it makes students work together, collaborate much more. And there's a part of, you know, I've got no evidence for saying this next statement, but I'll give you the feeling. You know, I think it's why geographers are so employable. You know, and geography remains one of the most employable academic degrees and has been for 16, 17 years now. And I think that's part of it. So there are real cases for putting students in real world situations to help them make sense of that world. And I think what, what the Institute of Education and FSC came to the conclusion in this publication, you can download that by, by David Lambert and Michael, Michael Rees. Um, I'll put the hyperlink on this when you download, if you want to download this presentation from the conference website early next week, I'll put the hyperlink on there. But that's, that's the conclusion they came to, that whatever happened at GCSE, we had to ensure high quality field work. And I'd make a strong case for saying, look, taking a, student, taking a group of students to th three points along a river to show that rivers always go like that, I don't think that's a high quality fieldwork experience. I think that's a fieldwork experience, but it's a list of tasks, really, that students do. And there is doubt. I think many teachers would say it really is doubtful as to whether controlled assessment has really brought us to a situation where we have high quality fieldwork. It was, it, was it was a dog's dinner of a bit of a mess, to be honest, uh, controlled assessment. And I, I don't think we'll look back on it fondly I don't think history will be kind to, to controlled assessment as a, as a process. But, and this is the big but, um, FSC, Field Studies Council, Institute of Education, I think all the awarding organisations, everybody seem to recognise if we don't have some kind of mechanism for field work, the phrase that one person present at that seminar that day at the Institute said, it will wither and die. So we have to find some way of making it, making it work. So, I've done a lot of work with, with Andy, thinking about fieldwork and the WJEC as they've been, the new EDUCAS team of examiners, trying to get to grips with thinking, what is it we value about fieldwork that we want to keep? And Andy had a slide which he put together for some of the WJEC training, the feedback training from last year's examination cycle. And this was the kind of the first thing, if you like, real world settings not just to go out into the real world, but actually to have a, that sense of awe and wonder. That was a phrase that was in the WJEC sponsored lecture last year. I'm, I'll quite unashamedly use it again this year. I think it's something I, I believe in passionately, that if you can take students to a, an awe and wonder setting. Yeah, it doesn't have to be an, a big waterfall in Iceland. It doesn't have to be sort of 800 pounds for four days. Yeah, it might be Malham Cove. Malham Cove is still a great place for awe and wonder. It might be just going to the Peak District. It might be going to a city centre. Um, I still run some field trips, for instance, in London. And you know, going to East London, to the Olympic Park, to Canary Wharf, that's a sense of awe and wonder for many students as well. Field work can be in a variety of settings, any of which can be awe and wonder, not like that. And I, I'm quite unashamed, that's my awe and wonder picture from South Island, New Zealand, but there you go. I'm allowed a little bit of indulgence in, a, in, a, in an opportunity like this. But I think there's something as well, that when we, when we have awe and wonder in mind, I think we've got to have a sense of, well, what is it we're after? 
um, in field work? Is it, is it just to go ooh and ah? Well, actually, I don't think it is. I think what we're really after is an opportunity for deeper learning. And that was one of the phrases, I think, the first meeting we ever had with the team. Somebody, I think it might even have been you, Andy, said, look, you know, feel what's got to be about deeper learning. And the phrase that many of you as teachers would be, will be using, you know, what, if you like, off, Ofsted call it these days, is rapid progress. And those are two words that sort of strike fear into the heart of many teachers now about how you demonstrate that your students make rapid progress. Well, I think fieldwork is an ideal opportunity for making rapid progress for that, that deeper learning. So how do we do that then with a terminal exam ahead? And how do we, how do we make sure that serious, and I've used that word, I should have bolded that, that middle word, that independent inquiry is being maintained or developed? Because I think another legacy of controlled assessment is there's precious little independent inquiry. And I don't think that has to be kind of rocket science. I don't think that has to be sort of anything particularly major. So let's, let's distill this back to then core essentials. If field work has to be something, if you, if you like, at whose heart lies the whole concept of inquiry. And I think when we take students out, we probably ought to have that in mind. That said... I can imagine some situations, and sometimes I experience myself some situations, where students actually want to go to an environment where they're led and they're shown something. And I know that at universities, you know, I only say this because my, well, he's not my godson, but he's, he's, because he, his parents are atheists. You know, it's one of those complex situations. Somebody that Alistair tutored at Queen Mary, you, I think, took your students to Las Vegas and, and the west coast of the States, didn't you, year two. And so Tom did the rounds of the family, sort of, you know, having collection time, you know, being especially nice to everybody and hoping that, you know, some tenors might fall his way, and, and they usually did. But isn't that a bit of, bit of a look-see? As, as well, a bit of both, exactly. And there's nothing wrong with, with having a look-see. David Job, who many of you, I'm sure, in this room might have read about in, in terms of his discussions about fieldwork, he, he says that one of the most valuable things you can have as a geographer is to have somebody who's really specialist in a particular landscape to help you interpret it. And he says, you know, we, we ought to you know, not denigrate that. Just in, this, in our search for collecting data and getting the wellies on, if you like, or getting the land use maps out, we ought not to forget that actually sometimes to get students looking around them and interpreting what's around them, whether it's a physical landscape or a, an urban landscape, whatever kind of landscape it is, just to experience it has got some value in itself. So... I don't, want to, I don't want to sort of take away the value of that because it's got some real heart, but I, uh, real heart, but I think that inquiry for most field work at GCSE is probably at li lies at the heart of, of, of our field work. And so if that's the case, and if we're after independent learning as, as a, an object, if you like, in itself, and something which will lead, I think, to, to deeper learning, then I think it's important for students to be involved in that whole inquiry process. And, and it goes to the heart. I think nearly every GCSE awarding organisation expresses uh, its, its content, the things it wants you to teach, through a series of key questions and key ideas. It's as though you know, the key ideas, if they're statements, they're, they're statements to be, if you like, almost slightly contested. They're almost like hypo hypotheses. 